Ready. They were designed to be the best. They met enemies face to face, endured tragedies and enjoyed victories. They went down in history due to the bravery of their crews. They are the ships that deserve to be called USS North Carolina and USS Washington were the first US battleships commissioned after 1923. First, the Washington Naval Treaty and then the London Naval Treaty hampered the construction of new battleships in the United States for almost 15 years. By 1937, the engineers of the US Navy had defined the main specifications of a modern American battleship. Main specifications of battleship North Carolina. Length, 222 meters. Beam, almost 32 meters. Draft, more than 9.5 meters. Total displacement, 44,800 tons. Main power plant, four compartments with two Babcock and Wilcox boilers each, and a set of General Electric steam turbines. Power. 121,000 HP. Cruising range, 17,450 miles at 15 knots. Armor, main armor belt, up to 305 millimeters. The main armored deck, 140 millimeters. Turrets were protected with armor from 178 millimeters to 406 millimeters thick. Conning tower from 178 to 406 millimeters. Armament, primary armament, nine Mark VI guns with a caliber of 406 mm, installed in three triple turrets. Dual-purpose artillery, 10 coaxial Mark 12 mounts, caliber 127 mm, 10 times 2. Anti-aircraft artillery, four quadruple mounts, caliber 28 mm, 12 machine guns, caliber 12.7 mm. When North Carolina was in Pearl Harbor for repairs in September of 42, the 1.1 inch systems were replaced by what I'm sitting in now, the Bofors 40 millimeter quad mount. Fifty caliber machine guns were replaced by Orlikon uh, 20 millimeter cannon. Air Group, three Vought OS-2U Kingfisher aircraft. The battleships in World War II would carry these planes uh, for a number of missions. One of them would be to search out the enemy, also to observe the fall of shot from the artillery, from the naval gunfire, and to adjust fire as necessary to hit the target. Uh, they would also, of course, search for submarines, and should they find one, they could attack it. Uh, but they also played a big role in World War II on the battleship North Carolina as, as rescuers of downed pilots. Initially, North Carolina was designed to be armed with 14-inch guns. The decision to increase the caliber was made at the last moment. Intelligence reports said that Japan was building some super battleships. Moreover, it turned out that three turrets with 16-inch guns would fit perfectly instead of the 14-inch turrets presupposed by the initial design. As a result, this decision became a real breakthrough for U.S. shipbuilding. 47 men inside the gunhouse of that turret. It's kind of hard to believe because it's small. Now this turret goes all the way down to the keel of the ship. That armored cylinder that the turret sits on is called a barbette. In the whole gun mount, there'd be 177 men. Which for three guns makes up, that's almost 600 guys, making up almost a third of the crew. The battleship was also fitted with two radars, which controlled the primary armament's fire. This main battery director being one of the highest points in the ship, highest man points of the ship, was subject to all the pitching and rolling of the ship. So in weather prediction at the time, uh, 
hurricanes could not be predicted ahead of time. So this ship uh, found itself in hurricanes and uh, there are accounts of water uh, from, from the breaching or rolling of the ship uh, reaching as high as the platform at the O10 level, one level below us. And those men who were lookouts were subject to quite severe weather conditions. But uh, and you can imagine uh, if you're 11 stories above the main deck, what, what uh, momentum you're being subjected to as you're being pitched and rolled. The information from this center was sent to the artillery calculator and the automatic firing device, an analog computing device, a predecessor of modern day computers. The purpose of these computers was to put a projectile, which could weigh up to 2,500 pounds, 25 miles away. Uh, it's a dumb projectile, so it has to know where it's going when it leaves the ship. And these computers calculate in approximately 26 different variables. Anything from barrel wear, wind speed, Coriolis effect. Our ship might be moving in one direction, the target ship in another direction. So the computer is tracking where the future target will be. The computer took seven men to operate each computer. There would be up to 72 men in these rooms. The rooms are air conditioned for the equipment, not for the men and we're, we're told it would be up to 90 degrees and 90% humidity in these rooms. So it was very difficult conditions. Uh, but these were the battle stations for all those men. By April 1944, North Carolina was equipped with radio location systems, including radars for discovering air and surface targets. Welcome to the USS North Carolina Combat Information Center primary function during an engagement would have been to keep track of all air and surface contacts around the battleship during the war. Uh, there was two search radars located in this compartment for that purpose. Um, back behind you was the main air search radar. It was called the SK-2. It could track aircraft, uh, depending on the weather, about 100, 110 miles. And we have the SG uh, surface search radar located up forward here, which could see a large a warship, such as a battleship or an aircraft carrier at about 25 to 30 miles. On August the 7th, 1942, the United States began the landing operation on the Guadalcanal Island. The Japanese command concentrated their forces at the Truk base, preparing a strike against the US fleet near the Solomon Islands. On August 24, the Japanese launched about 80 planes at the US ships. North Carolina was escorting USS Enterprise. The ships formed a circle around the aircraft carrier with a diameter of about two miles. It was the first battle for North Carolina. At 1712, the dual purpose guns opened fire on the Japanese bombers attacking Enterprise. The fire was so powerful that a dense umbrella of exploding shells covered Enterprise and the Japanese aircraft had to turn away. Then the ship was attacked by torpedo bombers from different directions. Repelling the enemy aircraft, North Carolina unleashed such a massive barrage from her dual purpose guns, anti-aircraft cannons and machine guns that it astounded her allies as well. Admiral Kincaid from Enterprise asked the battleship's captain, are you afire? They decided that the battleship was ablaze from enemy hits for seven minutes of the battle which eyewitnesses called nothing less than seven minutes of hell. North Carolina shot down from seven to 14 aircraft. The dual purpose artillery proved itself during this engagement and in the following operations. And they had a round called the AAC or the anti-aircraft common round. It was a round specifically designed to do damage to aircraft, 
We also had a secret weapon in World War II. We had a proximity fuse on some of our anti-aircraft rounds. They had a teeny little radar system inside the nose cone of the shell, which would detect proximity to an enemy aircraft and detonate without actually having to hit the aircraft. And these were very, very effective. Of course, it was top secret. Even the sailors loading and shooting the guns didn't know that they were shooting. Uh, it was a well-kept secret until after the war. Since her arrival in the Pacific Theater of War and until the last missions in July 1945, North Carolina never engaged enemy battleships in a direct artillery duel. However, the battleship's artillery was used in all major operations of World War II in that region. Now, North Carolina in her history uh, never got a chance to go up against an enemy battleship. But she did fire almost 2,500 rounds against shore targets as part of an amphibious assault. She was part of nine shore bombardments against the Japanese-held islands, including mainland Japan. Near the end of the war, the Japanese were suffering defeats in one battle after another and losing ships and aircraft. So they resorted to the kamikaze tactic. We're standing on the signal bridge of the battleship North Carolina. And it was on this very spot in 1945 that one of the most tragic events of World War II and the history of this battleship took place. And on that day, 6 April 1945, North Carolina was steaming in company with a US destroyer off its port quarter. So North Carolina was vigorously trying to defend itself from this kamikaze attack as was the U.S. destroyer. The kamikaze passed over the top of North Carolina and crashed into the sea on our starboard side. The U.S. destroyer was tracking that kamikaze and unfortunately it did not cease fire soon enough. So one of its last rounds, a five inch shell, actually impacted this five inch director. Now there were 15 men inside that director. Three of them were killed instantly. The other uh, men in there were, were severely injured as were others standing around the deck. It was a very tragic example of friendly fire. On September the 2nd, 1945, Japan signed its surrender aboard USS Missouri. The next day, North Carolina set sail back to the United States. On June 27, 1947, the battleship was officially inactivated and put into reserve in the state of New Jersey. The ship accomplished her task. Escorting aircraft carriers became their primary mission. Those were battleships that bore the main weight of attacks from the Japanese aviation, both carrier-borne and land-based and Japanese kamikaze. Thanks to battleships, aircraft carriers could complete their primary mission, which was to deliver strikes on the enemy. So this was their purpose, to escort and defend carrier task forces. North Carolina remained in reserve for 13 years. Then her name was stricken from the Naval Register. After that, she was purchased by her namesake state for 250,000 US dollars. Two seagoing tugs helped the battleship navigate to the city of Wilmington, North Carolina, where on April 29, 1962, she was opened as a war memorial. They were designed to be the best. They met enemies face to face, endured tragedies and enjoyed victories. They went down in history due to the bravery of their crews. They are the ships that deserve to be called Naval Legends.